Thank you for your word today. But we're just going to go by your word. And God, uh, you've got great things to tell us, Lord, how you want us to line our life up with yours. And so, God, uh, we just thank you for your word today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you're new today, you picked a pretty good day to come in and kind of see that we don't mind talking about difficult things usually. And so today's pretty tough, but we're going to do it. Uh, we're in this book called The Song of Songs. And uh, some of your titles in your Bible will say The Song of Solomon. So I want you to take notes today. This will be a real good day to, to take some notes so you can think about and pray about what God's going to put in front of you today. And so uh, I think the guys are really leaning in today because we, we're talking about great sex, which are two words that, that usually don't go together with church in, in, in church's past. Um, but we're going to go to our theme verse. This is a verse we've been using every week so far, just to kind of kick, kick us off. And I believe it's the, it's the overall goal of this whole series. And this is what it says. It says, Solomon's song, song of songs. <clears throat> and of the, what it's saying is, of all the 1,000, 1,005 songs or poems that I have written, this one's the best. And it's so important because it actually shows up in God's Word. Okay, so that means that God wants us to know the information that's in this beautiful book. Okay? And so this is her speaking, and she speaks most of the time in this one. And this is what she says. She says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love, she's talking to Solomon, is more delightful than wine. What she's saying is the way you treat me is absolutely incredible. And so I want to say that that's the goal up front for every person uh, who's in a relationship with, with you would say that, that they would say, man, you know, this person understands love. Uh, and I'm not just talking about love making right now. I'm saying, man, you really know how to treat people. You really know how to understand conflict and relationships. You know how to value people. And that's what she's saying here. And in the next verse, she says this, pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. So in other words, what she's saying is other people are smelling how wonderful you are. She's saying your name, which means your reputation, your reputation to love other people is like perfume poured out. It's infecting everybody. It's infecting your kids. They admire you. The people at work, they appreciate you because you understand love. And she goes on to brag. She says, no wonder the maidens love you. All these other ladies love you. They love to, you know what they're saying? They're saying, I wish my husband was like your husband. And so that's the goal here. And, and here's, we, we've been looking, I wish you'd just go back. I'm not going to recap because today's too important. But if you go back on our website, you'll see uh, uh, so every sermon we've ever done. Okay, you can track it down. And these will be good ones, especially parents from the last one we did two weeks ago before the baptism. I believe that, that would help you out. So we pick up in the... Uh, in the Song of Songs in chapter 3, we're not, actually not going to read it, but that's what we're going to skip over. I just want you to know a little bit what we're skipping over. It's a wedding procession. Okay, it's pretty fun to read. It's not what we're talking about today. Um, but you can go back and read the rest of chapter 3, and you see that Solomon had, in his wedding, had 60 rooms, and they all had swords. We said that last time. And maybe in the future, when we think about picking bridesmaids, 
we start thinking about picking groomsmen, that those people are to protect your purity. That's what they're for, not just to show up for pictures. But you'll go back and see that he had 60 groomsmen. So that's a lot of protection he had. And he brings her in this carriage. Uh, it's not this, it's like a chariot, except it doesn't have the, the, the wheels on it. It's the kind where everybody's toting it on their shoulder. And you get to see a picture of that, and the interior is purple. So you can go get some really good wedding tips there if you read the rest of chapter 3. But we're, we're picking up in chapter 4. And this is in the tale, their honeymoon night. So in their culture, it would have looked like this, though. When they had their wedding, they wouldn't have been considered actually married, officially married, until the relationship was consummated. Until they had sex, is what that means. Physically had sex. So there, would have been this, there wouldn't have been this, uh, I now pronounce you man and wife. I don't know if you've been to weddings and hear that. They, there's an announcement. Well, they hold that announcement. And, and they go straight from the altar into these chambers, into a chamber, just those two. And that's where they consummate their marriage. That's where they have sex. So that there's no reception. They just go straight into there. People would gather outside that chamber and go, Sometimes even even more than that. So are y'all hearing me pretty good? Yeah. All right, I'll keep going. Don't even worry about that. So what you're getting ready to see now is a description of when they left the altar and actually went into that chamber. A lot of people think God is some kind of crude, like he doesn't want to talk about sex, but he actually invented sex. And I don't think if he would have went to the garden and saw Adam and Eve, and he heard something rustling in the bushes, but it was just a woman. <laughs> it feels like one of our first, uh, when we first started the church, man, this stuff happened all the time. And I thought, I thought it was behind us, but you know, sometimes there, there is a force working against you. And so uh, anyway, I don't think God would have been surprised if he, would have, if he would have looked around and heard some rustling in the bushes and then all of a sudden... He saw Adam and Eve and say, oh my God. Or he wouldn't say, oh my God. He'd say, oh, I God. All right. I think that wouldn't have happened. I think that he would have, oh yeah, that's what I gave him. I'm glad you're liking it, buddy. Sorry. And the fact that the church has become incredibly silent on the matter is a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake that we're not talking about it more. As a matter of fact, probably what you've heard in church, maybe growing up or in your life, is don't do this, don't do that. Don't do that, shout not do that, let's pray. You know, a lot of times that's what we hear, but sex is so much a part of our culture, it's constantly confronting us every single day. And I read a study this week, I think you'll find it interesting, and it said that men think about sex on every single day of the week, that has a T in it. Tuesday, Thursday, Tatterday, Tunday, <laughs> today, tomorrow. <laughs> right? It's in our face, man. It's a shame we're not, we're not talking about it. But God wants to redefine it. He wants to get that definition of sexuality back. And the Bible is very vocal about sex, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And praise the Lord, he gave us a whole chapter that we're reading now about just, just devoted to marital intimacy. I'm going to take this opportunity to say that, that God's standard is this for marital in, uh, intimacy. It's actually the biblical example of marriage. The only one we're given is between a man and a woman. And what we're talking about, what God's plan for us is that sexual activity that he designed us for only fits in that context. So everything else outside of, of a marriage, a biblical example of marriage, is destructive. And, and Hollywood would never let you know that. It would never say that. It, Reader's Digest said, and this is a serious, serious test, is 91% of all sex scenes on television are outside of marriage. But they'll never tell you, man, all the, about the shame and the wounds and the hurt and the tears and the pregnancies, things they'll, they'll never talk about. 
but they're lying to us. The, devil, the devil's lied to us. Okay, we do have an enemy that, that knows that's such an important area of our life. I told you this would be heavy today. So instead, we don't know where to learn it from. We don't know where to go. Uh, church isn't talking about it. Mom and dad don't want to talk about it. Schools just talk about the parts, fallopians and Philippians. So we wind up learning from it from something like a bathroom wall at a gas station. You know what I'm saying? Ain't that some of the first images and words you saw? I was going to put QT up there, but I've got to be honest with you. QT is clean in there. That's a good place to go if you just got to, right? But I want you to know God has something that he wants to say to you today, and I hope you'll receive it with your heart. Man, you're probably coming from all kind of backgrounds, experiences, opinions that you have. I hope you'll consider what God has to say on the matter. I think we're a gentle church. I think that we present the gospel in a gentle way, and it's non-condemning. You don't have to leave here condemned. But I hope you'll cons consider what God's got to say on the matter. I want to challenge the devil's way today. I want, to, I want us all to know that there's a new way in Jesus' name. And I'm, it kind of makes me sick a lot of times that, that man, the fact that the world's so successfully, I'd say, uh, define this area of our life and made it look like that God doesn't know what he's talking about. But if you do it God's way, you know, a lot of people can say, well, that's boring, man. You might go to heaven, but you can be bored the whole time if you do things God's way. And that's just not true. So I looked up a, a video and I, I jotted down these guys what they were talking about sex. Just kind of normal, 25-year-old guys and just how, you know, idea of what, what they were saying about sex. And here's one of them. One of them said this. He said, man, we're just mammals. We're just mammals, dude. We're animals. We're just doing what we, you know, we can't help it. God made us this way. You know, just follow what you feel. Those are some of the things that he said. And I don't know about you, but if I did everything I felt, I'd be in jail, you know. But if you follow your feelings, you'll wind up in the enemy's trophy case. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that, because we're not animals. We are made in the image of God. And so my buddy's dad, when I was growing up, his dad was a hunter. I mean, a manly man, a fireman. You know, he would go duck hunting, turkey hunting, whatever season it was, he was hunting. And man, he had a, a in his house, it was too small of a house to have 10 deer heads, deer trophies, you know what I'm saying, hanging out the wall. It was too much, but he would take us with him. And I don't, I don't particularly care for hunting. I don't know how you feel about it, but I've been. I've been and watched it and watched what happens. And, and man, he, he knew his stuff, and what would happen was um, we'd be out there, just he's got the gun, we're just sitting there being quiet, having to pee and freezing our tail off and hungry. <laughs> I guess it was pretty fun. But I learned a lot. I paid attention. I paid attention, and... And here's what would happen. He explained to us what when a deer gets in a rut. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? What being in a rut means is I guess they're in heat. It's mating season. And other, other times they are alert. They are paying attention, head up, and they're, they're watching and waiting. They're really sharp. They're smart animals. But when they're in a rut, when it's heating and mating season, they get real stupid real quick. And they get vulnerable. And, and they go just based on that instinct. Like this guy's talking about in the video, this instinct. And let me tell you, bam! That's when you wind up a trophy on my buddy's dad's wall. See what I'm saying? If you go with your instinct and what you feel. And he'd also do it with turkeys, and he could do it. He didn't need a little machine to do it. He could do it with his mouth. And those turkeys literally thought that he was a female. They just got real stupid, and bam! They'd be a trophy for him. And man, that's what it's like. And here's another, another guy said, it's just recreational, man. It's just a recreational activity. It's just kind of a sport, you know. You just kind of get it while you can. You have as many partners as possible, man. You, get, you know, uh, live it up before you get tied down. Go get lots of experience, sexual experience. And the world also wants you to know that, man, they want you to think it's a, an isolated event when you have sex uh, outside of that definition of, of marriage uh, they'll even say whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas right it's a pretty funny little commercial uh, but but really what happens in Vegas really stays with you forever and a lot of us could probably you know uh, attest to that we've been lied to but that's not the truth 
Uh, as a matter of fact, God designed sex for, to be a very spiritual event when it takes place. It, the Bible says that the two become one flesh. And it's not just talking about physical. It's also talking about emotional. Because something happens when you have sex. Something happens in the heart. Right? A piece of you goes with that person. A piece of them comes with you, but it's torn apart. But God designed it that way to be that strong. He wanted it to be the strongest bond in all of creation, and that to be between a husband and a wife. So some of you are already feeling bad, man, and we told you the first time there's a couple rules here. Apply this to you, and know that, listen, Jesus, he says this about himself, I make all things new. So you don't have to be condemned. Uh, the majority of us in this room never met that standard. But, but Jesus says, I make all things new. So I don't want you to feel um, shame. You don't have to uh, feel that with an encounter with Jesus. So the Bible says that not only he forgives it, he, he cleanses us. And I think a lot of times we forget that. I don't think somebody maybe took the time to talk to us about, yeah, we're forgiven, but we're also cleansed. We can, we can receive that cleansing that only comes from the Lord. So if you're not a virgin, you can become one. If you're not pure, you can become pure. If you're not righteous, you can become righteous. So don't let the devil lie to you and make you feel that way. Um, so let's get started. That's not even getting started. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Let's get into it. It says, how beautiful you are, my darling. So they're in the chamber now, right? Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Notice with me, he's talking about, he's talking all of a sudden. A lot of this in, in the Song of Songs, she's doing a lot of the talking, but he started talking. In fact, what you might find interesting here in a minute is there's 16 verses that we're covering here, and he's talking 15 of those verses. So he's doing all this talking, and he's admiring her body. And he says, your hair, whoo! He says, your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. And so there would be this mountain and it'd be all these black goats on it and they would just kind of trickle down, kind of running. And what she's literally doing is letting her hair down. She's letting it down. That means it's about to go down. <laughs> the process is starting. He says, your teeth, man, they're like a flock of sheep. So he's really working his way. He's starting at the top and just taking the elevator all the way down. <laughs> he said, they're just shorn like coming up from a washing. And what he's saying is, you brush your teeth. <laughs> no bad breath. He's really pumped and fired up about that. Man, this is awesome. And then he says, talking about her teeth, he says, each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. He's saying, you've even got all your teeth. I love that. I love that about you. you got all your teeth. So we know two things about her already. We just started. Is... She's not a hockey player, and she's not from Bessemer City. Oh, 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 shh, shh, shh. sorry. Sorry. I wasn't going to say that. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. <laughs> if you boo, it means you ain't got no teeth. Okay, that's just how it <laughs> I'm just kidding. It goes on to say your lips mm, are like scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil, your temples behind your veil are like the halves of pomegranate. And pomegranate are red. And what he's saying here is you got those cute little rosy cheeks. I like that. So he's really admiring her in every way he could think of. And he goes on to say your neck is like the Tower of David, built with elegance. Now he's admiring not just the fact that she's, he thinks she's hot, but he's talking about her, that she, she is noble and that she is elegant and she's regal and, and she's confident because when your neck is up it, it's it's something about confidence man and he's loving this and he says he says on it hang a thousand shields all of them shields of warriors and what he's teaching us right now Solomon's teaching us right here is a lot of a lot of things that us men need to learn first of all he's talking <laughs> he's talking he doesn't even touch her yet he hadn't even laid a hand on her for 11 verses so what's he doing here? Now, I wish you'd take some notes right here. This is where we get some help. We get some help because we need this, man. We, we need some help in this area. So 
This is the first one is when sex is done God's way. Now, there's a lot of way to do sex, right? There's plenty. But I feel like, man, you wouldn't be here if you're trying. I need to know, Richard, what God's way is. And I'm going to try to line myself up with that, okay? I, I believe that's why you come. I believe that's why you show up. And so I'm just going to give you uh, what's, in, what's in the Bible, what's in Scripture. So it says, when, when sex is done God's way, it's affirming. It's affirming. He's saying, I'm, I'm admiring you before I touch you, before I even try to make love to you. I want to tell you some things. I got some things that I've noticed, and I want to verbalize it. And here's the lesson here, guys, especially us guys. that Women are greatly motivated and even aroused, even aroused by what they hear. It's really, really important. And what they hear is what is most important to them. And we don't, we, by nature, ladies, sometimes, I don't know what it is about life, it makes us not communicate well. Um, it's not that we don't, we're not articulate enough to say it, we just don't. I'm not sure why that is, but he's decided, he's, man, I'm, I'm just, um, this guy's a genius. He's telling us what to do. And I think you might know that, but I want to remind you, uh, especially for men to the ladies, that, to, to affirm her, to say the right things, to be uh, very careful to put a guard, is, is what the Psalms say, put a guard over your lips. What you say, man, it, it, can, it can lift their soul or it can damage their soul. What you say matters. And here's, the, here, here's what you need to know. Write this down. Your words are critical, critical to godly intimacy. It's critical. And that's true, even with your relationship with God. Your words are critical. Well, God knows how I feel about him. You know, I don't need to get all fired up about worship. I don't have to jump down, jump around and all that crazy stuff. And, but here's the deal. God likes to be affirmed. He likes to be affirmed. He knows he's holy. He already knows that. He knows he's great, but he likes to hear it. God likes to hear it. That's why worship is so important. So again, I tell you to get your hands out of your pockets and tell him. Go ahead and lift up. The Bible says lift up holy hands and let him know. A lot of people push back on, on worship. You know, that's just not my, not my style. But God has a personality. He has a love language. And he wrote 150 chapters. I went and looked. And so how many chapters uh, tell us about how he likes to be loved and adored and praised? But how many of us withhold that? So it's in, our, it's in our relationship with God. God wants us to be affirming to Him. He, want, he thinks affirmation is important. And it's important in our relationships. You've got to verbalize that. And a lot of you know I'm a therapist outside of here. And I'm telling you, 80% of what I work on every single time is communication skills with people. They don't do it well. And so, the, again, the Bible says there's 150 chapters about how God likes to be adored and praised and worshipped. So the best thing you can do in any relationship is really, it's not about you, to throw down your agenda and serve that person according to their love language. What is it that they need? And, you know, we're, we've become, and you can just look at commercials about the enhancement. We can look at porn. Porn is about me. Enhancement is about me. Toys are about me. Is that awkward? I want it to be very awkward right there. And I believe that's a symptom of what's really happening here is that, that God wants us to be about the other person. He wants us to be about the other person. And sometimes we get centristic in that. So words of affirmation are not my love language. It doesn't come naturally. That's not what makes me feel loved and connected. I, you know, I, I appreciate it. But you know, for Holly, my wife, it is. I notice when I tell her affirming things about her, you're beautiful. You're really looking good. You know, I'm really proud of you. I'm very thankful for you. I tell her that very often. And, and here's what I found out, that when I do that, it's a good day at the Myers house, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I put two and two together. So. That works. Because I don't have two kids because I'm good looking. You know what I'm saying? I got them because I, I know what to say and when to say it. And I'm going to give you a little tip, a little bonus tip about that affirmation. Public affirmation. 
Public, doing it in public, that means even more to them. I, I remember sending Holly a gift. Is a few jobs she had back several years ago, and I sent, I was going to get her flowers, but then I got her edible arrangement. You know what I'm talking about? Got all the fruits, it looks like flowers, and I, I sent it to her work. I could have waited till she got home. I said, you know, I'm going to give it to her in front of somebody. And all her lady friends at work, I guess they might have thought for a minute it was for them, and then when she got it, I think she loved it. It made her feel special that it was done publicly. And we need to do public affirmation. If you're starting out in a relationship, if you are married, you need to either discover it or rediscover it is affirmation, especially public. And so great sex and godly sex happens when we affirm people. So what's this next one? Verse 5, it says, Your two breasts are like two fawns like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Now, I know this is the Bible, but that is what you think it is, okay? Do we got a picture of those fawns? Yeah, there's a couple of them. And what Solomon's saying here, he's saying, look, you know what it's like with two little deer on the field. They're just sitting there kind of playing, they're a little nervous. Uh, but some of y'all are hunters, and you know you got to come real slowly at those fawns. You know what I'm saying? You don't just walk up and say, hey, fawns! Because they'll run away if you do that, all right? Same thing at home. Slow down a little bit, fellas. Scare them fawns. Don't you love the Bible? And what he's teaching us here is this. When sex is done God's way, there's a lot of ways to do sex. There just is. I mean, everybody's... Not following the Lord, they're just not. That's where they are, and that's our job to to show them a, a new way to love them and and um, point to put to God's way. But when sex is done God's way, it is tender. Write that down, tender. So Solomon's wife here, she wasn't the object for his passion for personal use. She wasn't there to fulfill his his fantasies. He realized his job was to be. Tender. And here's what he said. I'm not going to cheapen this. I'm not going to cheapen her in this. And you know, I get a lot of questions professionally. You know, what, what is off limits in the bedroom? I mean, what, what, is, what are we allowed to do? And, you know, how far should it go? And, and, here's, and I'm being serious about this. And, you know, how creative can we be? And I told you about your kids and revolution kids. And here's a, here's a good way to, to, to really broach the topic is you need to let her be the judge of what that is. Okay? Yeah, God wants you to be creative. All those things. He wants, He gave it to you. It's His gift to you within your marriage. But listen, it's the best idea is to talk with her about it. Okay? To make sure that you show value to her. There's, there's a lot of ways, ways to have sex. But what... Let her be the judge of that. Make sure it's nothing that cheapens her. Is that okay to say? Okay. Verse 6 says, Lionel Richie is all over this Bible. <laughs> Until the day breaks. Dancing on the ceiling, whatever you want to call it. Until the day breaks. Um, he's letting her know, look, this ain't going to be nothing quick. We're going to be here a while. Because I want to talk to you for a while. Um, because Solomon understands that men are microwaves and women are crockpots, right? We're ready, aren't we, guys? Bam! But women need to simmer. Everybody say simmer. You got to simmer. He knew that. And so he says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. Notice there's two of those, and that's what he's talking about. And he's trying to be romantic here. I want you to write this down. Because godly sex is not boring, but write this down. When sex is done God's way, there's a lot of ways to do sex, but I'm trying to do it God's way. What does God have me to do in this area of my life? When sex is done God's way, it's passionate. It's passionate. And the reason I want to highlight this is there are people out there that really think, if I go for God and do things God ways, God's way, I'm going I'm to be bored. I'll get to heaven, but all along the way it's going to be boring. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's what the devil wants you to believe because he, he, throws all, he starts to throw all these counterfeits at you. To, and those counterfeits destroy our lives. And God wants you to have a life 
and live it to the full, especially in this area. He, it's just his gift to us. So John 10.10 10 says this. This is what's going on. This is what the plan is. The thief's purpose, your enemy and mine, is to steal, kill, and destroy. Even your sex life. But it says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life, including the bedroom, including in the area of sex. And, that, and listen, God's way works. So write this down. Passion takes effort. If you're going to have that passion, it takes effort. Now, I want you to write that down if you're a note taker, and all of you should be. And it's not automatic. It takes effort. And I hear this a lot. We're just not in love anymore. The grass is greener on the other side. No, no, no. The grass is greener where you water it. It just takes effort. We're just not in love anymore. I hear that quite often. And you're not going to be unless you put the work into it, unless you do the work. I've heard people say, well, I, don't, I, don't have to, I shouldn't have to work for it. Yes, you should. I don't know who told you that, but it does take work. Fireplaces. You like fireplaces? I like fireplaces. It's warm, right? And it's crackling, can cuddle. You know what's bad about fireplaces? Is you've got to go out and get the wood. It's cold out there. It's been raining. You know, it makes a big mess. Sometimes it's just not worth it. It doesn't feel like it. It takes work, and it's the same way that it, it takes work. When I first dated Holly, man, I threw everything at her. I did every love language there was. I told her how good she looked, because she did. She does. Watch out. I hope the video camera is broken, too. And she says, my car's dirty. I took it and washed it and waxed it, vacuumed it out. Got her matching hair and bone. Don't do this. They're out of style. Flat chain and, and matching necklace. That was 1993. Don't do that. But I did back then, and it was awesome. Took her out, right? Did all the things. But something happens, man. Something, at some point, just life tends to happen. Life happens. Bills come. Kids come. And you, you kind of whittle it down, man. And it just kind of comes into nothing if you're not careful. But you can never stop. All right. And I started paying attention a little bit, just preparing the, over the past month or so for this. And Go ahead and buy her those flowers. Walmart is your friend. Right at the front door. They make it real easy on you. $7.99. It's right here. All you got to do is reach and get it and just take it home to her. And when you get home to her, after she passes out, pick her up and y'all talk about it. You know what I'm saying? It's easy. They made it, it couldn't have made it any easier. And ladies, you can help too. Amen. Amen, guys. Okay, I got one. And he ain't married. <laughs> ladies, you can help too. Sometimes y'all come to bed in those space suits. Like four layers of clothes. I'm cold. This is comfortable. You couldn't see through if you held a flashlight up to it, you know? Like, come on, ladies. Romance takes effort. But I'm telling you, the devil will offer a, a counterfeit. It'll make it a whole lot easier. Man, you can get porn on your, I'd say within three clicks of your smartphone, you can be on porn. But it'll destroy your, it'll destroy your life. So write that down. Don't let the enemy offer you a counterfeit. It's something that's going to be easier. It's just easier if I do this. It's less work if it's just that lady at work, us talking. It's less hassle and hustle. I, just got, I can get what I need just on my smartphone. Let's keep going. Verse 7 says, all, um, all beautiful you are, my darling. Watch this. There is no flaw in you. Boy, he's laying it on. He's good at this. But we already know that she's flawed physically. If you've been, maybe you, had, you weren't here the first week, we saw her background. We saw that, that she, she was very insecure about the way she looked. She had worked in the sun. She had, she had dark skin from the sun. And back then, tans weren't in. They were not in. And, and she was self-conscious about it. She, her skin was cracked and dry and dark. And so we know that she's flawed physically by her own admission. She's saying, I'm, I'm not, she said it, I'm not the prettiest girl out there. But Solomon decided, he made a decision to do something that was very important. 
And every and literally every relationship needs this. He said, listen to me, you are my standard. You're my new standard. And that's one of the reasons that pornography is so destructive. The devil lied to you and said, man, I'm not hurt. you're not hurting anybody. This is just you and your mind. It's not, it's not bothering anybody else. But what's happening here is you're changing your standard. You probably didn't even realize it. You're changing the standard that your wife could never even live up to. Instead, if you stop looking at that, man, because you can be healed and redeemed just like everything else. You can be healed and re- redeemed. And for all you ladies, no offense, but Holly is my standard. i got to be honest with you. I am. I'm extremely attracted to her. Yeah, physically, sexually, but emotionally, spiritually. Man, y'all got some catching up to do. I'm just kidding. That's, she's my standard. So we've got to make, make it a point not to let other things threaten that standard. Other things come in to be the standard. So here's what I want you to say. When sex is done God's way, there's a lot of ways to do it. But when it's done God's way, it is secure. It is secure. Because the enemy's designed to make you feel sexually insecure. That's what this, our culture is walking around. There's a lot of sex, but there's a lot, also a lot of insecurity attached to it. And that's his design. And God's way, it is secure. Solomon said, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you feel secure by not letting any other standard come into my mind. Somebody would be saying amen right there. And watch what happens in this next part of the story. It says, you have stolen my heart, my sister and my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful is your love, my sister and my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine and fragrance of your perfume than any spice. Here it goes. Your lips, let me talk about it. They drop sweetness as the honeycomb. And you're seeing the first physical contact here between this couple. And the Bible's not going to let us see the inner parts, right? But they start to kiss. And he said, your lips, are, your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. Now, this is a French kiss in the Bible. <laughs> and I want to challenge this a little bit because this is 19 years, 1900 years before France was even a nation. <laughs> so basically, this is a Hebrew kiss. <laughs> Hebrew kiss. And it also means your God is cool, right? So he invented that. Everybody's always trying to take God's stuff, I swear. You know, I started really thinking, man, what, like you hear a lot of times, what's the line in there for teenagers? What's the line in there for even if you're adults? What is it, man? And some of y'all are like, Phew, that's, that's a lot. It's those Hebrew kisses, right? When God created physical intimacy, he did not design for it to, to not follow through, to not continue. To, it's difficult to put the brakes on it. And when we use it out of context and out of out of what he's meant to, it's hard. Smell. I can stop it. Hebrew kisses. I can. St- no, you can't. There is an urge to do more. That's God's design, and, and that's why we get into trouble because God's design is is more and more intimacy. Does that make sense? That's why we have hurt and wounds. And um, but God wants our intimacy to be full and blessed. But you have to do it God's way to get that God's way. So here's what happens next in verse 12. He says, you are a garden locked up. And notice what he's saying here. He's saying, you, you waited for me. Man, it, you waited for me. My sister, my bride, you are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Because a lot of times animals would like to get in a spring and they would, do, they would close it up so it couldn't be messed up. And that's what she had done. She had waited on him. And I'm not naive enough to think I'm talking to 200 virgins here today. Uh, I mean, I know that. And this is one of those verses also that you can get really discouraged about. You know, I could never live up to that, to that standard. And, but that's not true. I think uh, every single one of us, including me, can have this verse. I'll write this down and I'll explain why. When sex is done God's way, God's way, got to make that choice you know do it God's way or not but I'm convinced that God is 
making progress with you and he, he wants you to do it his way. And when sex is done God's way, it is holy. It's holy. Well, Richard, what, what is holiness? What does that even mean? So I wrote it down for you. Holiness is not people who are perfect. It's people who have been forgiven. Forgiven. So get in line with the rest of the people in the room that we, we've screwed up in the past, we've blown it. But here's the gospel, gospel message today. Is that Jesus forgives and cleanses all unrighteousness. That's what he does. That's why he lived. That's why he died. So that we could be forgiven and cleansed. Now God has a standard. He has a standard. And that's why he had to accomplish on the cross what he, what he did. He paid for it. And he didn't just pay for it. He, he cleanses us from it. So Jesus doesn't just pay the bill. He makes your heart brand new. He does a lot more on the cross than a lot of times we'll give credit for. He didn't just pay for it. He gives us a brand new heart. So what that means is you can leave here today holy. You can leave here cleansed. You can leave here pure. You can leave here forgiven. That's what I love about God. That's what I love about this church. Is, and we can bring anything in here and know that nothing is out of the reach of God. And here's what's going to happen once you decide that. Once you decide, man, that's what I need. That's what I want. That creates some, you know, um, look, some of that scary. You just don't know where I'm at with things. But here's what's going to happen. You're going to keep coming to church, and the Holy Spirit's going to get involved. And you're going to start to see what God's Word has to say about your life. And He's going to change you so much when you do that, because He's going to surround you by people that love you. They're not judging you. And you're going to start to change so much that people won't even recognize you anymore. That's what's awesome. And some of you have gone way too far in the area of sexuality. But what we're finding out is there's also a lot of people, there's scores and scores of people that this has happened, that something happened to them sexually that they did not want to happen. Right? I'm talking about sexual abuse. And listen, you can leave holy, you can leave cleansed, you can leave pure, you can leave, leave forgiven. I want to give you the opportunity to enter into that process of healing, man. That's why, that's why we do church. We didn't want to invite a bunch of people who already know the Bible, they already got it figured out. That is not church. We want to open this place and, and make it where a place where people can have hope and start the healing process. So you don't have to leave here condemned. And I want you to know, I said, what do I want them to know? That you can leave here with God's very best. That, and even in, the, in, the, in your sexual life, your sexuality, you can have God's best. And he finishes this last line, and she picks up at the, in the middle of it. Verse 15, you are a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. Right? And he says, she says, she stops him right there. She interrupts him. And she says, you know, Solomon, you said for four chapters now, do not awaken. Remember that part? We ended both, both the first two with, do not awaken before it's time. Don't, don't, don't get out of God's timing on this. But here, what she says, she says, okay, you've been spitting it, boy. It's been good. I like hearing what you got to say about me. She says, we're married. We're doing it God's way. And she says, awaken it. That is awesome. She says, awaken north wind. That's a strong wind. A north wind is a strong wind. And come, south wind, and that's a gentle wind. So a gentle wind and a strong wind. Blow on my garden. She's talking about her body now. Um, that, that, that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing passion that I, I really feel like that way too many people have never experienced. They've never experienced that. And God's trying to Bring it to a level of intimacy that's far better than what the world's is. Far better. And I want you to write this phrase down and then I'm going to pray for you. God's way isn't just right. It's better. It's better. So we should bow your head. Just bow your head where you are. I've been so ready to get to next week. 
ever since the last baptism, like, oh no, we got that message next week, and um, I'm ready for next week. We're going to wrap this series up, but it's going to be good. But in the meantime, you know, um, I've been praying for you. Um, you're not unlike anybody else if you've struggled in this area. I think we all struggle at some point with our sexuality. Man, we're left to figure out how to deal with it and what to do and how to maneuver and, and navigate. And so often, man, we, we just make a, a turn that is, is not God's way. And maybe up to this point, you just didn't know God's way. Man, and when we read God's word, it's so, it's so loving and it's so um, gentle. So I didn't expect to, um, to cover this stuff and it um, not be difficult to, to really digest this and to have a response to it. And maybe there's a conversation that needs to happen. And that's one I'm, I'm certainly willing to have uh, to, to kind of guide you through it as your pastor and as uh, somebody that wants you to position yourself to, uh, to experience God's best for your life. So I don't, I don't take that lightly. What I hope you heard through all of that, though, is, is the forgiveness that's available, the purity that's available. Get your virginity back, your spiritual virginity back. You can't change what happened. But from this day forward, you can. You can say, man, I, I may have messed up, but I'm going to do it God's way from here on out. Here on out. You're not alone in that. 